Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, much. Much. Thank you everybody. And the, uh, the screen here is blinking. I'm not sure if that's going to continue or not. We'll, we'll see how that goes. So uh, thank you. Raise your hand if you think you're an absolutely phenomenal, perfect manager. OK. All right, close, right? Uh, now raise your hand if you think you have some room for improvement as a manager. Good, good. All right. <laughs> Well, you, you've come to the right place because whether you're already a great manager or you have a lot of room for improvement as a manager, uh, when you walk out of here 100 minutes from now, you'll have scientifically proven strategies and tactics which you can apply starting immediately today, which will absolutely help you be more successful. Uh, now, I, uh, I like this picture because uh, it's a nice reminder that it's fun to win. It's fun to be on a peak performance team. It's fun to lead peak performance teams. And honestly, some of the things that we're going to be going over tonight are practices that the Golden State Warriors have used to go from being a pretty mediocre basketball team to one of the greatest basketball teams of all time. So uh, a little bit about myself first. I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. I studied political science at the University of Iowa. I then have a chance to study in Austria and Germany for a couple of years. I work as an English teacher in Frankfurt for a couple of years. I work as a business journalist in Madrid, Spain for a couple of years. Moved to the Bay Area in 1991, and I do door-to-door -door phone sales for a few years, uh, which was interesting. And then I'm lucky enough to get into Stanford for business school. Graduated from there in 96, and then I was lucky enough to get hired at Yahoo as employee 258, which was a phenomenal time to be at Yahoo. And I worked on Yahoo auctions, Yahoo classifieds, Yahoo shopping, both in the US and internationally. Then I went to Blue Lithium, which is a uh, comparison shopping website, and they were later acquired for $1.2 billion in 2007. There I worked on biz dev and sales, both in the US and in the UK. And then I went to uh, Blue Lithium, which is an internet ad network, which was acquired for $300 million by Yahoo. Uh, so I went back to Yahoo a second time in 2007 and built some really good teams there. And then I went to Drawbridge, which is a mobile advertising startup, and was there for about a year. Uh, then about five years ago, I decided to start doing leadership consulting, teaching companies how to build high performance teams, how to set people up for success, how to be a first time manager. And right as I started doing that, I was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, I won't talk about that too much tonight, except to say my health seems to be good uh, four and a half years after my initial diagnosis. But it made me think really hard about my life, my work, my purpose, the impact I'm having, the legacy of the work that I'm doing. And so I'm hoping that I can touch your lives tonight in a positive way. I hope I can help you become better managers and help your teams be more successful. And I'm honored to be here. I'm delighted to be here. So I'm happy to share with you some of the best secrets that I know of, of teams that I've been involved with in, in Silicon Valley. So a few instructions. And can you read that OK from the back of the room? All right. So. Uh, Everything cool? So first of all, there's going to be some writing exercises when I hand these out. And uh, I'm asking you to share what you've written with someone that you're going to pair up with. We're going to have a few different exercises like that. I encourage you to share only what you feel comfortable sharing, but I think the more you share, the better. Uh, in addition, please be respectful of how others, how others think and feel. We have, as usual, a typical Silicon Valley, wonderful, di diverse group of people with different life experiences. So please be respectful of that. Uh, we have a very limited amount of time. This is a three-hour version. Sorry, this is, it feels like a three-hour. <laughs> this is a 90-minute version of a, of a three-hour workshop. I do a full 66-hour uh, version of this workshop as well. So I'm really condensing things down to some of the best things that I can share with you. Um, there's a sign-in sheets, which I think you've got already. And I'm going to send out a summary uh, of this workshop to everybody with some additional resources. And then thanks to Han Nguyen, who is here. Uh, Haley Leibson, Christina Lee, and Bill Hops on the camera for making this possible and for Meteor Network. So I'd like to thank them for making this, this possible. OK, next slide. Let me see. What do we got here? OK, so your number one job as a leader is, um, any ideas? To lead. What does that mean, Douglas? Inspire people to work hard. Good, all kinds of team efforts. Who else would like to add to that? To be the best version of themselves. To be the best version of themselves, okay. Anybody else? Good. Ma'am. Provide 
provide vision, direction, and then also assist in unblocking the team with anything they need. Let me see. So a little bit louder. Provide vision. Provide vision, direction, and then block the team with anything that stands in their way. Provide vision, direction, and then block the, block the team if anything stands in their way. Un Unblock. <laughs> all right, and block for them. That's a football analogy. All right, good. All right, those are, those are all good. So what I would say is your number one job is to set your team up for success. Okay? Which I think w some of those answers definitely touched on that. Set your team up for success. Now, one way to think about it is to... Um, do what you can do to create leverage for your team. So if you spend one hour doing something, you will save one hour of time for everyone on your team every week going forward. Okay? That's leverage. That's the sort of impact. The other thing is that you could spend one hour training or teaching people on your team so that they're more efficient in what they're doing every day or every week. That's, that's the sort of leverage you can have. Another way to think about it is, um, when I, when I started at Blue Lithium, I inherited three people onto my team, and they came to me and they said, hey, Jim, I, I want you to help me out with this one thing. And I said, well, Melissa, I can do that. There's someone else on the team who can help you do this as well. And in the meantime, I can work on getting a new compensation structure for you, so you're paid more and everyone else on the team is paid more. Now, would you which, which do you want me to be doing? And she said, well, work on the compensation. I said, okay. So I worked on the compensation, got a much better comp plan for her, Everyone else on the team, much more motivated, better lined up with the salespeople. And, and that was a good use of my time because that was something that she really wasn't in the position to do on her own. And my boss didn't have time to work on that. Then, another, then soon after that, one of the other people came to me and she said, hey, Jim, I want you to help out with this. And I said, well, I can do that, but I think you can, you can figure this out as well. And in the meantime, I can work on hiring three more people onto this team so that you're not working 60 or 70 hours a week. Which would you rather I do? And she said, no, hire more people. Okay, so these are very simple examples. The examples I'm going to give tonight are, are pretty common sense and pretty straightforward. But I think they're very practical, relevant for, for being a good manager and a good leader. So the idea is do what you can do that you're in the unique position to do that often the people on your team can't do and that maybe your manager doesn't have time to do to have the biggest impact as possible. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay. So... What I want to do is another way to think about this of what the, the manager's job is to set them up for success is, the motiv is the, that they want to do their job, they can do their job, and they know how to do their job. Okay, so what this means is that they want to do their job means they're properly motivated to do a good job. They can do their job means they're properly empowered to do a good job. And then they know how to do their job means you train them in order to be effective. It's a very simple framework. I learned this a long time ago, but I think it's been very helpful. And the basis of this is weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings where you have really good communication so that they are motivated, so that they are enabled, and so that they know how to do their work. And all of these fit together very importantly. If you have one part but not the others, things start falling apart. So they're all very core components that, that complement each other. Now, we're going to go over motivation very quickly and over empowerment quite quickly. We're going to spend most of the time on they know how to do their job and then the communication part. Okay? Now, real quickly, on the motivational part, let me take a sip of tea here. <clears throat> so Adam Grant is a professor at the Wharton School, uh, who you might have heard of. And he says that if people find their work to be meaningful, they're up to five times more effective and productive in what they do. And it's independent of the role. They could be a janitor at a place like here, or they could be a surgeon. Independent of the work, if a person feels like what they're doing is meaningful or purposeful, they can be up to five times more productive. So as a leader motivating your team, you need to always be thinking, what can I do to inspire these people? What is motivating for them? What is meaningful for them? How can they be part of something bigger? Regardless of what the task or the role is. So you always want to be thinking about that. Another way to think about that when it comes to motivation is to not be too hands-on. Don't be a micromanager and don't be too hands-off. Right? And a lot of times I think younger managers, they're too hands-off. They're not comfortable with authority. They're not comfortable with the power. They're not comfortable being 28 years old and managing people who are 25 years old. And that happens a lot. But, but if you're more hands-on, then you need to be able to help the people and set them up for success and be comfortable with the authority so that you can lead. That's part of what leadership's about. Okay? So as a, just a quick summary of this, I'd say find meaning to boost productivity. Again, we're going very quickly through this part. 
Find meaning to boost productivity for your team. Don't be too hands-on, don't be too hands-off. Find that right balance. And then focus on the other parts. Focus on empowerment, focus on the know-how and the training, and focus on really good communication as the basis for this. And if you do that, then your people will be motivated. Okay, just going through this really quickly. We're gonna have handouts very soon and you'll have this whole, this whole framework with all the notes in the handouts, okay? First of all, let me stop for a second. Any questions, comments? Does it make sense in violent disagreement? Good, okay. All right, so let's go on to the part about empowerment. They can do their job. Okay, now part of it is giving the right tools and resources. The right tools and resources. And I like this example because sometimes you're giving people an ax when they really need a chainsaw, right? And if you, you need to always be thinking as a leader, am I giving the right tools to my team? I'll give you an example. When I worked at Nextag, which is a very tough culture to be in, the CEO, he hated spending money on anything. And this was a company that later got acquired for $1.2 billion. And one day to the next, all of us got an extra monitor on our, on our desks. We had all, we were all working off of desktops. We didn't even have laptops. And we were amazed. It's like, why, why is he spending money on an extra monitor? And what happened is he, did, he read some research which indicated that if a, team has, if a person has two monitors rather than one, they're up to 30 or 40 percent more productive. So from one day to the next, we all got an extra monitor. And, it, and it's great. And I mean, I, I like having two monitors, and I was really pleased that he did this. But this is just a very simple example of a very simple thing that probably costs $300 or $400 per person at the company for a hardware solution, which could boost the productivity of people 30 or 40 percent. And you know, there's not that many things that a CEO can do from one day to the next to boost the productivity of his or her people by 30 or 40 percent. So it's a very simple example of just giving people part of the right tools. You know, this is a hardware example. You could have examples with software where uh, people, you know, maybe they need better access to databases. Maybe they have uh, better software in order to pull more granular data so they have better business insights. There's lots and lots of examples where you need to be thinking do the people on my team have the best tools to set them up for success? It could be hardware, it could be a good ergo setup, software. Um, and similarly, in, in terms of resources, you know, it's a matter of investing in the right initiatives and setting people up for success. If you, if you tell someone to do something but you don't give them the proper funding to do it, maybe it's better to just not do it at all rather than doing it but not properly giving them the resources to be successful. Okay, any questions? All right. Good. Now, the next part on empowerment is getting out of their way. Getting out of their way. Now, I mean, having authorization to do the right things and the minimum of office politics and bureaucracy. So when I was at Yahoo in the late 90s, it was an amazing time to be there. And there was uh, one, of the, one of my colleagues, she turned to me and she said, you know, the best way to be a manager here is just get out of the way of, of our people. Right? They've got clear goals. They're very motivated to be successful. They know what the output is that they want to have. And, uh, and we can leave it up to them and their brilliance and their creativity to figure out how to get there. So this was, an, this was really an ideal environment where we just needed to make sure we didn't stifle their creativity and their innovation. Now, it's not always that case, but in this case, it was really one where you wanted to step back and just say, OK, this is the output. This is the deliverable. And I'm happy to help you, but just, just go crazy. Okay? Now, Part of that is having authorization to do the right things and, and giving people the power to, to do that. And, and sometimes you're going to delegate something to somebody or empower them to do something, and they're going to screw up. And you might even think they're going to screw up in advance. And hopefully you can sort of manage the downside of that. But the point is, is that people really appreciate when you have trust and faith in them to do a good job. Even if you don't, maybe you're not sure if they're going to be successful with something that you delegate to them. But if you do that, they're going to appreciate that you have a vote of confidence in them. They will rise to the occasion. If they fail, they will learn a very valuable lesson. And if they do it, then they're going to be a lot more confident and feel a lot better about themselves. So this is part of the, this is part of the motivation of being able to delegate to people and really set them up for success. Uh, any questions so far? Sir? I'm just kind of curious about recommendations around boundaries. So mm -hmm. For example, a company I knew up in Vancouver, one of the things was anyone could write a, you know, a PO for any dollar amount. And I'm not kidding, like a million dollars. <laughs> but they had boundaries. And the boundaries conditions were 
you had to have um, talked to anyone this decision affected. Uh, you had to have considered alternatives, and um, if considered, if this were your company and your money, would you make this decision, right? And if you could answer yes to all of those, then off you go. And so right. that was, it was boundaries, but fairly loose. I'm, I'm curious, like, if you've seen other examples of sort of things, that, this is the box you can play in, yeah. or whether you recommend against that. So, well, that, that's a great, and did it work well at the company you're at? Uh, they did pretty well. They got bought by like Kodak before it imploded. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, it went up and then went down. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I mean, I, th I think you, you strike at the heart of the matter. And I think it's for every leader to kind of figure out what, what are the boundaries or parameters. How much of an explosion can we handle? How much, can we, how much money can we afford to lose? How valuable of a lesson do we want to take? And, um, you know, maybe if you don't want to let them blow up the company, but maybe you'll you let them do a, a little minor screw up. Uh, to, and they might do it right. You know, you could be wrong. They could be the ones who figure out how to do it right. So I say boundaries are appropriate, and you just need to do sort of a risk risk reward kind of balance there. But I say in general, delegate as much as you possibly can. Uh, there's a quote from uh, Ralph Nader where he says, "The goal of leadership is not to create more followers; it's to create more leaders." So the idea is that if you get hit by a bus, you spend all of your time building your team up so that any one of them could step into your role and do an awesome job, right? That's, that's the sign of a good leader. Okay, good question. Other questions or comments? Good. Uh, sir? Just um, an overarching question you know, throughout your presentation. Please. Um, just, I'm wondering if there's any distinctions between teams that are co-located versus like geographically dispersed. So the question is, uh, is this about whether, if, do I differentiate between teams that are co-located versus geographically dispersed? Um, I have not specifically baked that into the presentation, but we can, we can talk about it. And if you, if you feel like there's an appropriate time to, to bring it up, we can. But it's, it's, hopefully this applies in, in both situations. I think, I think we do cover it a little bit later on, on um, expectations. But if I don't address it, I definitely Bring it up again, okay? Good. Okay, so let's keep going. Regarding minimum of bureaucracy in office politics, now most startups <coughs> need a little bit more process, right? What worked as a, a company with 10 people or 50 people is not gonna work when you have 500 people. It's just not, I've, I've, I've been there, <laughs> right? And so you need to be able to delicately, lovingly, intelligently start putting in a little bit of process as you grow and as you scale. That's how you scale. Right? You can't scale if it's just the kind of creative you know, craziness that you have when there's t 10 people in the office. So for most startups, they need to put in a little bit more process. For bigger companies, there's usually way too much bureaucracy, and it's horrible. And then your job as a leader is to streamline it or get rid of it as much as you possibly can. Now regarding politics and, and office politics, what I'll say is, for me, the definition of politics is you're in a company where how decisions are made and who has the power is not clear, is not transparent. That for me is a political organization. And what you want is the opposite of that. What you want is a clear, direct, candid, transparent organization where people can come to the room and say, okay, look, we gotta make a decision. You come with your data, you come with your data. We're all gonna sit here, we're gonna argue about it. And then I'm, I'm the decision maker. I will come up with a, a decision listening to everybody. And then after that, we go out of the room and we're all on the same page. Okay, that for me is a non-political environment. And people appreciate that. They appreciate the clarity of it because the opposite of it is a political environment where people go into the room and they smile and they're nice and they don't hurt anybody's feelings. Very California, I know, <laughs> right? Uh, but, but when people go out of the room, then they start lobbying and they start gossiping and they start trying to figure out how to, how to get their initiative. And that sucks. I mean, that is very demotivating for people. So. Think about this in terms of the impact it has on motivation and have a, and we talk about communication and clarity uh, in more detail later, but this, this is an important part of it. Good, okay, any questions so far? Okay, M M yes, Diana, nice and loud. How do you decrease politics? Okay, how do I decrease politics in an organization? What I, what I would do is I would have a culture where people can speak their mind that it's a hardcore meritocracy that reward people with the best ideas, no matter where they are in the organization or, or anything, education level, anything. If they're there and they have a good idea, hopefully the good idea wins out. 
and you can set an example by making decisions based on what is the, the strength of the idea and the, the merit of the idea, and have a culture where people can go into the same room and argue passionately but respectfully to each other and come out with a decision. That, that's how I would avoid politics. And when people try to do these sort of backroom deals or lobby for stuff on the side, say, you know what, this is not productive. We will have a meeting and we will talk it all out together. And then, and yes, the decision maker will reach a decision, but we will hold people to the decision that was made. I mean, it's, it's not magic, but that, that seems to work well from what I've seen. Good question. Thanks, Diana. Other questions? Okay. So we're going through this pretty quickly. Um, but now we're going to do a little bit of writing, so it's not just me talking all night long. So what we're going to do is we're going to hand out these things. Thank you, Haley. Owen, here you go. If we can get a few back here. Let's see, can I give that to you? Okay. Make sure everybody has a copy and you also have a pen to write with. These are going to be your action items. These are going to be your takeaways. This is your actionable stuff. <laughs> This is the stuff I want you to be implementing and applying to your work starting tonight or tomorrow morning. Okay, so everyone needs to have a copy, all right? Take a minute, please. Yeah. <laughs> okay, does everybody have a handout? Yes? Okay. Everybody have a pen to write with? Yes? Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So let's go to this. Question number one. You flip the page, please. All right. So how can you provide better tools or resources or empower your team more? Okay? You've got a little bit of room here to write. So you've got about three minutes. Go ahead. Get really specific what you can do. Maybe it's obvious. Maybe you've been meaning to do it for the last three months. Write it down. These are your action items. Please begin. This is the hardcore business stuff right now. Good. Okay. So I'd love if someone would either share what they wrote or if you have any questions or any surprises or insights from doing that writing exercise. You surprised you didn't think of these before. Good. Yeah, I, I ask I ask really easy questions, but I, I did this workshop last week, and a friend said, you know, a lot of management is just basics. I think he said all management is basics. So I'm going to tell you a lot of basic stuff tonight, but I'd be surprised if all of you are doing them perfectly. <laughs> and I'll tell you a lot of the things that I've screwed up throughout my career. So, so Douglas, you thought of some things. Thought of you saw you. Sorry, you thought of some things that. We're obvious, but you're surprised you hadn't read them before. Mm -hmm. All right, anyone you'd like to share with us? Well, the first one was that I'm only one person, and I have a million ideas, and I get about 10 of them done. It's ridiculous. So I, I wrote down, uh, get the team working on relationships that will result in more users, more buyers, more investors. They have more time, and I haven't given them that leadership. Okay, so giving the team a little bit more opportunity to step up. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. And I, and we're going to get into that in, in goal setting as well. So, thank you. What anyone else would like to share one of their examples of what they came up with in terms of either empowerment or resources? Anybody? Sir? This is one that I often struggle with because it's allowed them to fail forward. A lot of them to fail forward. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and my struggle is I feel like if I don't catch them, then it's my responsibility. Yeah. But if I don't let them make the decision and fail, then there goes the, the great learning that they can have from it. Right. Or even opportunity for success. Yeah. Like right. Possible. Now, do you have any particular initiatives or projects that you can hand off to someone and, and know that I'm not sure they're going to be able to do it, but let them, let them step up? Yeah, oh, there, there's, yeah. there's always a lot of things, but you kind of feel like as the manager or the leader, part of my job, almost like my kids, is I don't want them to, to, I don't want them to fail. Yeah. You know, um, so, so, you, so the moment that something, an idea comes up that 
you feel like, oh, I've done that before and I know it's not going to go, you want to interject and say, uh, no, let's not do that one because I know. But that, that can kill their creativity and the potential for them to learn. So. Absolutely. I completely agree. And, there's a, and being a parent, there's a lot of, there's a lot of management lessons. <laughs> there really is. There really is. Yeah. Um, good. I, and, and you might find it useful to actually have a, a candid, direct conversation with the people on your team and say, you know, traditionally I felt a little worried about handing this off to you because I'm afraid it may not go well and it might blow up and you might fail but, and the company can't afford that, you know. But on the other hand, I want to delegate things to you even if it's not 100% sure you're going to get it right, but I want you to learn and grow. And I think if you had that kind of a direct, clear conversation, you know, it's like the meta conversation, right? Yeah. If you have the meta conversation, then I think you can have a lot of, of candor and clarity and, and have some real um, breakthroughs that way. So thank you for bringing that. Okay. Anybody else? Anyone else like to, like to share? Ma'am. Um, I'm managing people that started off as more junior folks, mm -hmm. and so they've done a lot of operational work, and now they need to graduate to more like strategic thinking. Mm -hmm. And one of the challenges I'm having is finding time to allow them to do that. Yeah. So it occurred to me that maybe I should have them write a list of the things that could help them do the operational piece of their job faster. Right. Um, so they can then learn the, the more te strategic pieces um, because they're at capacity because we're a startup. Right. <laughs> Good. Good. Um, again, maybe obvious, but I haven't asked them to write those things down and share them with me. Awesome. Okay, and let's support your Erica, right? Let's support Erica, and we have Douglas over here. And sir, what is your name? Ume. 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 Okay, Uma. Let's support Uma and us also for rah rah, right? Because the the public the the public commitment means it's much more likely it's going to happen. <laughs> no, it is, right? I mean, <laughs> there's all sorts of research on this. So the fact that you've spoken about this on public in, in the public means it's much more likely it's going to happen. So. Good. Okay. Any other comments from anybody? Okay. So we're going to have, sir. I was just say clear delineation of responsibilities that, you know, you know every person's role on the team and every other person knows their individual roles. You know, it's, it, it works when it's like two or three people, but when you get to ten, you've got to reiterate that. It's out of control. Right. So you're clear delineation of roles. Excellent. And that helps also probably from an empowerment standpoint because one person knows that they're on the hook, they're actually responsible for making something happen, and the other person can relax and focus on something else because they're not, they're not trying to do that other task, right? Very good. Okay, sir? There's actually one thing connecting all of these, which is the, the plain discussion with someone around what is it you want to do next? And from here to there, can you help them chart a path? So there's a connective thread here. You know, all of these could be connected by working with your employee to understand, like your your report. What do you want to do, right? Like, what, you know, in ten years, in five years, in two years, whatever it is, what are the things that you actually need to do between now and then? And using as that as a framework for an opportunity for them to try new things and fail forward, to let them take on responsibility, and also it's empowering them to be responsible for their own success. You, you want to become the senior whatever, product manager or the strategic whatever, great. What do you think that person needs to do? Oh, they need to you know, manage a project of this, blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. So if I hand you a smaller project like that, what are you, what are you going to do in order to so on and so forth? Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And, and what's your name? Brandon. All right, let's support it. That's, that's good. That's a, yeah, no, and, and you start seeing how these all start overlapping with each other. You're talking about empowerment, but it goes straight to motivation, right? And training, actually. So they, these, all, these all really complement each other. Very, it, it's a simple framework, folks. It's a simple framework, but it all really complements each other and, and holds, holds tight. Good, very good. Okay, let's keep going. I don't want to get you out of here too late. So, all right, so the part on empowerment we just talked about was Giving them, they can do their job, giving the right tools and resources, get out of their way, minimize bureaucracy and politics. Okay, now we went through those quite quickly. Now we're going to spend a lot more time on the know-how and on the, the communication through the weekly one-on-ones. Okay, now regarding know-how, they know how to do their job. They know how to do the job, which is really about training. It's really about training. And training is kind of a dirty word. I don't know, you know, it's, people seem to like, not like doing it, and yet it's so, so essential 
to being successful in a role. So let's talk about they know how to do their job. First of all, uh, I don't like silly acronyms just for the sake of it, but actually I think this, this works pretty well. The acronym GEMS, Goals, Expectations, Metrics, and Skills. Okay, let's talk about this for a second. How many of you have written goals for the people on your team? Wow, okay. Well, good. I think, I think we need more. Okay, in fact, I would, I would propose clear written goals for your uh, work lives and actually even for your personal lives. I do a whole separate workshop on goal setting. <laughs> I'm going to Texas next week to do a, a three-hour workshop on goal setting. I do six-hour workshops on goal setting. So this is just a very, very quick slice on, on goals. But goals are extremely important. So here you've got this data which says that people are 42% more likely to achieve a goal if it's written, and they're 78% more likely to achieve the goal if they do a weekly check-in with a friend. Okay, which kind of sounds like a weekly meeting with your manager, right? <laughs> right? I mean. It's, that's, that's powerful. So if you have an idea, but you don't write it down, it's just kind of a wish. But if you have it written down and you get specific about what it is, that forces you to think really hard. What am I actually trying to accomplish? What do I want my team to accomplish? And then when you do these weekly check-ins, it's a very powerful um, forcing mechanism. And I remember so many times when it's like, oh, it's 2 o'clock on a Thursday and I'm meeting my boss in an hour and I haven't done the thing I committed to him that I was going to do a week ago, I better hurry up and do this. And it is, even if it feels very childish, it, it makes it happen. It makes it happen. Ma'am? So, three slides in the goals, your wife's in the goal state. Do you remember what you're saying? Do you remember the responsible here, providing here, the goals? Here, here, go ahead. Please, please repeat it because we're recording. I'm asking who's writing the goals, who's accountable for writing the goals, so what do you assuming, think? What do you think? I think that it should be um, written by the team member and perhaps jointly accepted and clarified and worked on together, but not written by you for someone else. Well, there's 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 pros and cons to both of that. Um, <coughs> it's not. I think I think a bottoms up, top top down kind of consensus is nice. I've seen a lot of sales organizations where the salespeople will sandbag it and say we can only sell two million and the management says no we need you to sell ten million. <laughs> That's normal. That is absolutely normal. And you would not want to rely on the salespeople to just say oh we can only sell two million. If you're running the company you say no I think we can get to ten million and let me see what I can do to set you up for success to achieve that. So it, needs, it can be a bottoms up top down approach. But um, that kind of that kind of depends on the organization and, and the culture. But that's a very good question. Okay. So so this is about written goals, weekly check-ins to achieve the goals. Um, I remember when uh, um, I uh, uh, was at Yahoo and Jeff Mallet, who was the president of, of of Yahoo, he said no more than no more than five goals at one time. You can any more than that, you sort of lose track of it. You can. You can uh, accomplish a goal, knock it off the list, add a different goal, but it's, in, it's important to have not, not too many goals at, at one time. Now, let me check. I'm sorry, there's one other talking point I had here. Ah, yes, okay. Also, uh, I remember my first day at NextTag, I asked the CEO, do you have any advice to give me? And he said, the most important thing is knowing what not to do. The most important thing is not knowing what not to do. At any given time, there's 20 things that seem nice and cool and interesting, and 17 of them are just nonsense, and three of them are really going to move the needle. And your challenge as a leader is to figure out what are those three things that are really going to make a difference and move the needle in the business. And then make sure that those are the goals for your team, and keep your team focused on those. And, and that means saying no to a lot of things that seem kind of cool and nice and interesting, but saying yes to the things that you're just going to mercilessly execute on and don't stop until you get that done. And that feels good because then you say, okay, we're going to have a goal. We're really going to work on it. We're going to make it happen. And there's a great sense of accomplishment when you actually do achieve that goal. Okay? Questions? Good. All right. So that was goals. The next one was expectations. Now expectations is kind of like goals, but it's sort of a different thing. Uh, and sometimes it's sort of, you could even think of it as company culture. So, for example, if I'm a manager and I send an email to someone on a, at, on a Saturday night, 
do I expect an answer from them on Sunday night, by Sunday night? Some some, in some companies, the answer is yes. And in some companies, the answer is no. And I'm not saying there's a right or a wrong answer there, but the people on your team need to be on the same page about that. What are expectations? It's sort of like in some software companies, you have service level agreements, right? Where you have a certain level of, agree of, of, of service for a client, and, uh, and you pay for more to get better service, right? But the expectations need to be really clear in your company of, of how we work together. What is the culture? How do we reach decisions? You know, do people curse at work? Do they not curse at work? Do, are people on time for meetings or not? I, I was at a startup and I said, look, I expect everyone here to work at least 50 hours a week. And I'm not talking about FaceTime, I'm talking about focused, productive, at least 50 hours a week. And if you don't want that, that's fine. We'll, we'll talk about that in the interviewing process and this is not a good fit. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. There's other companies where it's like, okay, we want you to work 70 hours a week. And you might say, no, that's not for me, right? So these are the sorts of expectations that you want to be clear about. And when you think about when things are going wrong at your companies or on your teams, a lot of the times it's because the expectations are not right. People are not in sync on the expectations. And then you need to have a really clear, candid conversation about them so that you can, you can get on the same page. There's, this, there's a saying which is forming, storming, norming, performing. And really a lot of that is about getting on the same page with expectations. Good. Sir? I, I, I'm curious how many people in here have a user manual for themselves? So the question is how many people have a user manual for, for their own job? For themselves. For the, uh, like me. Yeah. I prefer email communications for things because I can manage it in this way. Mm -hmm. Phone is only for emergencies. If my headphone's on, that means fuck off, right? You know, yes. whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, profanity is obviously encouraged. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, it's something I've heard someone else do, and, and I kind of thought it was an awesome idea. I was just curious if anyone's actually used it. Okay, and anyone else has a user manual? Or has anyone used it on them and given them, you know, like a manager has given you their user manual? Um, Ma'am? I was just going to uh, make a comment, uh, and I'm just speaking for myself. As uh, Sometimes it's hard to hurt other people's feelings or come across as a very strong person. And, uh, and if you're dealing with authority, sometimes you know, coming across with a user manual can be off-putting. Okay. Um, so it's just, so, but I, 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 mean, I love it. I love the idea. So, so you're saying it could be off-putting, but you love it as well, the idea of a user Yeah, manual. I mean, I think it's great so people know uh, how to approach you. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it may not work for other people who may be not a uh, strong personality, but they can have clear boundaries, and their boundaries may be more blurry. <coughs> yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, you, and you bring up a very good question, which, which is, I mean, I use the word expectations, but I mean, culture works pretty well for this as well. And, and I mean, there are company cultures which are very intense or very, where what you just described would work perfectly well and other people are like, no, 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 there's no way we would do that. So your job is to run your career in a way so that you have a good fit <laughs> with the culture and you feel good in the culture and you can thrive in the culture of the company. And, and as a manager, you can also create your own little culture within your team. Uh, and maybe you're the only, per I've done lots of stuff that I was the only person in the company doing it. And then other people started doing it too. It's like, oh, that's pretty cool, Jim. No one does that, but yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, so good question. So this is, this is about expectations, all right? And it's important to get clear on them with your team. Okay, the next, the next one is about metrics. Now, we live in this big data, data-driven society, which is, which is wonderful to have data <laughs> to, to prove things and not just be wondering. Um, but we're, we're, we're overwhelmed with a lot of data. I think. And for many people, they have dashboards and so many numbers and so many metrics. And all I'm saying is help the people on your team by letting them know the key, the key metrics. And it sounds obvious, but when, when, I, when I started at NextTag, we launched NextTag UK. And after about a month, the CA, CEO pulled me into the office and he said, what's, um, what's your average cost per click? And I said, oh, God, you know, I don't, I think we're doing pretty well, but I don't, I don't know what it is. And he said, that's the only number that matters. He said, that's the only number that matters. Everything else leads up to that number. Everything feeds to the average cost per click. But that's the one number that matters. Now, I wish I had been smart enough to figure that out 
I hadn't. And honestly, I wish my, my manager would have said, hey, Jim, that's, that's the one number to look at. So, so for you, with all the numbers that are in your team, all the data that you're looking at, all the metrics you're looking at, and all the KPIs, you know, do your team a favor and point out to them the, the most important metrics that really are going to move the needle. And it's not going to be 20 things. Maybe it's two or three. And then hopefully those are lined up with the goals that you've established for your team. OK? Questions? <coughs> Good. OK. Then the last part is on um, is skills here, skills. Now, uh, they can be hard skills or they can be soft skills. When I started at Yahoo in 1997, I sort of had a role, which is kind of like biz dev. And very quickly, we did a, a redefinition of the jobs. And I was a, a product manager. And I didn't, I didn't know any HTML. I'm not an engineer. And so I started doing a lot of HTML. And I was terrible at it. And I was slow. And I was inefficient. And I was wasting people's time. And, and after about six months, my, my boss came to me and said, Jim, this is, this is crazy. Let me send you to a Saturday workshop on a couple weekends learn HTML from the bottom up, figure it out, stop wasting people's time. And I became much more efficient and much more productive as a result of just a little bit of investment of time to learn something. And that was just a simple hard skill. Okay? There can be hard skills where you need to learn, or the people on your team need to learn, I don't know, Python, Ruby on Rails, SQL queries, negotiation skills. They can be soft skills. They can be time management skills. They can be organizational skills, leadership skills. But you always want to be thinking, as the leader of your team, where's the skills gap? What does it take for people on this team to be successful? And what do I need to do to make sure that they're learning and growing so they can be successful as you're developing the people on the team? OK? Make sense? Good. OK. So that's goals, expectations, metrics, and skills. No questions? Good. OK. So let's go back to your booklets. This is question number two. So I want you to go back to the writing exercise Three areas where you can help your team with goals, expectations, metrics, or skills. Nice specific action items. Please begin writing. You've got about four minutes. Now what I want you to do, I want you to stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Everybody. <laughs> All right. I want you to take what you've written, pair up with one other person, and you've got about five minutes to share what you wrote. OK? Please begin. <laughs> OK, so you can go back to your original seats. Thank you for the pairing up. OK, so any surprises, insights, questions, anything you'd like to share? And, and we can give Ha a, a minute to run to whoever wants to speak first. Any surprises? OK. Ah, please. Um, yeah, my name is Antonina. So I would say that it's good to ask why, why person do this, why person think like this, and to, to let him explain. And when the person tries to explain to you, then ask them additional questions, so to point like where this person like misunderstand or so, so he kind of finds the right way, the right solution, and then he very quickly can catch up, work back, and like work much faster and learn faster this way. And also, I would like to add about expectation, <laughs> but it's like we discussed together. So each person has different expectation, and even describe this uh, like can describe some pro product or things differently. And when you say ask the person, okay, do you understand what you must do? And he said yes, it doesn't mean that he understands the way how you think about it. So mm -hmm. it's also again, it's better ask person, okay, you understand? Can you explain? Can you define? Can you explain to me what, what does it mean for you? And then you can work with this person. And about metrics, I like how you said about like to be specific about some numbers and point what's actually important to you. Because it's, it's the same way, like, person may be like, look at this metrics and think, okay, probably I will be considered on this data instead of like this data. Right. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. And, and if the, and, and hopefully the, the goals that you have that are written out for the, for the people, to the extent that you've got specific metrics, they're, they're reflected in the goals, right. almost always. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Yeah, other, other comments or questions, surprises from anybody? I can call call. <laughs> <laughs> One more person. Any, any, goal, any goal that you'd like to, 
a lot of you said you didn't have written goals for your teams. Is that right? Right? Yeah, I, I think that. Go ahead. Uh, not only do we not have goals for our teams, I don't think we even defined what the metrics or the expectations were. And it's good that you pointed that out. I don't know that that's not a question we're finding, it's just that something we found out about our own team. Good, good, good one. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the ways to think about it as the leader of the team is your job is to describe what, what does success look like? What does success look like? And anyone on your team should be able to come to you at any moment and say, hey, what, what does success look like to you in this role? And if you can't put that into really clear words, then you have a problem. You have a real problem. And they're going to have a problem too. And people are going to be demotivated because they don't know what they're even supposed to be striving for. Okay, so having clearly written goals, maybe it's hard, maybe it's painful, maybe it's tough trying to define the metrics, but if you don't do it, you're just flying blind. And you're, and you're waiting for problems to blow up. So th Yale, thank you for bringing that up. Sir. Um, one of the things that I've struggled with, and we were just talking about it briefly here as well, is when it comes to millennials, uh -huh. the idea of goals. <laughs> wait, 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 how many millennials are there in the room? I know. A couple? Okay. Yeah, good, okay. I, we love you. In, with, <laughs> and I'll get a little more specific, with those millennials that I've had the chance to work with, mm -hmm. the idea of goals is almost frightening. Mm -hmm. That rather not have them, rather they don't want to to even create their own goals, mm -hmm. which has been, leads to all the breakdowns of everything else. So I don't know if anybody else has that, that struggle. I'm curious, did you have goals when you were 24? <laughs> I, it, I, sorry, it's just a pet peeve for me, the whole bullshit around millennials. They're 24. We were exactly the same. Stop kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, uh, Brenda, the answer to your question is yes. Okay. Uh, right. And every day and every year after, and so on and so forth. It's the idea to just Frightens the ones that again. I don't want to include everybody in it, but those that I've had the conversations with that frightens them. Uh, they don't want to work on it. But I welcome. That's why I'm here. I'd love to hear what yeah. uh, okay. suggestions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go in the back. Yes, and I'd, well, thank you, Hop, for running around with the, with the microphone. And this, these are these are very good questions and comments. Please go ahead. And what's your name? My name is Ava. Um, Ava. I would actually like to challenge all of us as leaders in helping our team members by illustrating what goals look like. I think for the people that are having a hard time setting goals is because they don't know what an achievable goal looks like. So perhaps one of the things that you could be doing with your team, so rather than saying, what are you going to do next year, give them some ideas and that will help them out. Yeah, excellent. Um, so uh, yeah, sir, over here. Thank you, Hop. Hi, my name's Chris. Uh, I was just going to add something about millennials because we have an entire department full of millennials. Um, it must be awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's great. And we probably started having really explicit goals maybe a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And I would say it was scary the first time just because we didn't do it. Um, within six months, I think we're at a point where if we don't set goals for teams, they're mad at us as leadership because they don't feel like they have the clarity they need. So I think it's just a, a really small obstacle to get over. I don't, I don't think there's anything about millennials that are goal adverse. <laughs> good, thank you. Well, that's good to hear. And I, I think you're making very legitimate points. A lot of folks, a lot of us did not have written goals when we were 24. I do a whole workshop on goal setting. This is just a tip of the iceberg of what we can talk about. Um, but there, there's a little fear of having a goal because once you write it down, there's a possibility you won't achieve it, and that's a little bit of stress for anybody. Um, but it's stressful to not have a goal, as, as you're saying. I mean, if you're, I'm working all day long really hard, and I don't know what for, and I don't know what success looks like, and I don't know if I'm going to get promoted because of this, or I'm going to get fired. That sucks. So I think it's much better to have real crisp, clear goals defining what does success look like, what are we working on? Why are we doing this? How is the company going to be successful? Um, sir, are you? Okay, let, let Ha run to you there. I, I was wondering what's, what's the one minute version of the workshop? The one word, the one word version? The one minute version. One minute. <laughs> let me think. Okay. Have written goals for your team. Uh, make it so, and SMART goals, right? Specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time activated. Uh, make it clear why you're working on it and dig really deep into why this is purposeful for you. And remember, you get a 5x 
boost in productivity if you can find something purposeful for what you're doing. Make sure you reward yourself in the end. Also understand what are the obstacles you have to come over. Oh, I'm sorry, what are the obstacles you have to overcome? And who are the people you need to meet or network with or learn from and what skills do you need to develop? So that's, that's a quick comprehensive way of, of attacking any, any goals that you have. And if you, if you do that, then it's, you're really setting yourself up for success. Good, good question. Um, I think there's a, another gentleman. Is that Eric Berlin back there? Somehow I remembered your name. It's changed it, actually. <laughs> it's good. I feel like I made a good decision. Yeah. Um, so for a number of reasons, actually. So uh, but my question is around, we, I think we do a better job as a company of setting company goals, high-level company goals versus individual team goals uh, or individual contributor goals. And I was wondering, um, I think for, for you know, designers and creative people in general, uh, even engineers, I think setting the kind of smart goals can be difficult sometimes. And I think, um, what, do you, what are the ways to align those um, individual goals with the team goals uh, so that people feel like they're kind of impacting, you know, moving the needle, impacting the bottom line? And then um, the other question is, if, you're, if you miss a, a company goal, a high level goal, I mean, it's, what do you do both when an individual misses their goal, and how do you handle that? And then uh, when the company is missing its overall goals, maybe as a result of individuals missing theirs, um, how, do, how do you handle that as a, as a leader? OK, so let me see uh, if I can remember that. So. So first of all, I think everyone in the organization should have clear written goals. Everybody. Yes, software engineers. Yes, designers. <laughs> yes, HR people. Everybody should have goals as, as specific as possible and, and, and metric driven as much as possible. Individuals. Individuals. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and all the individual goals should, should roll up to the team leader's goals. Right? It's like, it's like a pyramid. Right? They all should. So, so the leader cannot be successful if the people on his or her team are not successful. End of story. There's no, there's no way that the leader should be able to succeed if everyone underneath him or her is failing. Okay, so there should be an absolute clear goal alignment in that respect. And, and that should all feed up eventually to you know, the division or, you know, I've worked at big companies and very small companies, but it should all, it should all be consistent. So there's no weird contradictions. There's no one who's doing great while the company's doing horribly. Um, there's a whole separate discussion of whether there's bonus structures built around achieving goals or not, and whether it's a quarterly thing or an annual thing. That's a, that's a longer conversation. And for some, for some startups, it's, it's not that way, but it's, uh, you know, it's, the, it's the equity. Um, so did that answer your question? Did I miss one? Did I miss the second one? I get, what, if if an individual or the company is missing oh, yeah. goals, how, yeah. do you, how do you deal with that both at the individual level and then also at the company level? So, if an so the question is, if an individual is missing the goal, how do you deal with that? Well, your job as a manager is to set your people up for success, right? So if they're failing, in part, you're failing. And you need to make sure you're doing everything that you can from what we're going over tonight to set that person up for success. Now, if you do everything you possibly can to set them up for success, the motivation, the empowerment, they know how to do their job, great weekly communication, which we're going to talk about, and they're still not really stepping up and doing it, then, then maybe that's, that's not the right person for the job. right? And you need to get someone else in there who's going to be a better fit and can do it. On, on a company level, if the company is failing, then, then I would think that any sort of uh, reward or bonus structure would reflect the fact that the company's not, not thriving. Um, and the other way around, if people are working really hard, then hopefully they're able to benefit from, from the company doing well also. Okay, so good, good questions. All right. So, okay, let's, th th there's obviously there's a lot we could talk about on goals, but let's, let's keep going. I don't want to get you out of here too late, but these are very, very good questions and comments. So let me see. So we are now going on to, so we talked about goals, expectations, metrics, and skills. We're going to keep going through the know-how <laughs> part here. And <clears throat> what number is that? Trillion. What could that possibly be related to? <laughs> okay, well, uh, all right, so basically it's the estimated cost of the US economy every year from workplace interruptions and information overload. Okay. 
This is a, according to an author, John, Jonathan Spira. So, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when the internet was new, and it was just amazing, the information you could, you could get from it, right? But as time has gone on, especially with social media, we're getting interrupted all the time with pings and alerts constantly. And people are really struggling right now. This is, you know, never in human history have human beings had to be so bombarded with information and data. And a lot of people are really struggling. A lot of people are struggling. Now, do any of you see this as a problem at your companies? Yeah, I think so. Now, um, there's also research that indicates that I think it's like 56% of peak performance employees find their workplaces to be too distracting. Too distracting. These are the high performance people. What, what, what was that sound? <laughs> I'm distracted. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so these are the high performance people who are distracted. The low performance people are the ones doing the distracting, right? They're the ones who want to make jokes and they want to hang out and they want to have fun and they, you know, they, but the, your most valuable employees, the people who are serious about the careers, the people who are trying to add value, who really want to learn and grow and do great work, they're getting distracted too much. Uh, often it's the software engineers, right, who are the most valuable people and they really need to be able to have their heads down doing their work rather than getting interrupted all the time. Okay, but not just everybody. Everybody can benefit from that. Okay, so if we agree this is an issue and a challenge, then here's a few ways to prevent interruptions. Take, take a quick peek at that, please. Okay, so I'm going to comment on these a little bit. So first of all, if, if you happen to be doing social media marketing at your company, then great. That's a fine reason to have Twitter or Facebook or Instagram on your desktop during the work hours. If you're not doing that, I see no reason why you should have that on. And I like Facebook, but it, it shouldn't be on. It's just a distraction. It's just an irritation. If you really can't live throughout the business day without checking in, then carve out 10 or 15 minutes over your lunch hour. And yeah, go back online and, and catch up with your friends on Facebook or whatever. But the rest of the time, if you're at work and you're really productive and really focused, then you don't need to be doing that. And remember, if you're at work and you're productive and you're focused and you're not letting yourself be interrupted all the time, that means you can actually leave work at 6 o'clock rather than at 8 o'clock because you've been heads down and productive and then you can go home and actually enjoy your life instead of just having long face, face time hours at work where you're actually not very productive. Okay? Questions? All right, number two. Create time locks, email hours, office hours. Uh, someone kind of touched on this earlier. I, I had two friends, very, very smart guys, and they just let everybody know. They check their emails at 8 in the morning, noon, and 5 p.m. <coughs> and they will get back to them at those hours. And other than that, if it's an emergency, it's something really critical, yes, pick up, my mo pick up the phone, here's my mobile number, call me when it's an emergency. Now, how often do you think they get called because it's an emergency? Angel? N yeah, like never. Never. This is, this is never, it's never that urgent that something can't wait an hour or two. Not really. Or let's just say very rarely. And in the meantime, they're focused and they're productive and they're getting their work done. Now, I remember selling phone systems 25 years ago, and one of the statistics I heard was only one out of seven times is a communication need to be real time. Six out of seven times, it does not have to happen that exact instant. It can wait five minutes, it can wait an hour, it can wait three hours. And I get it that things seem much more fast paced now than they were then. But, but still, I want you to think hard about are you interrupting somebody and what are you doing it for? And would you like it to happen to you as well? This is about reducing interruptions. Okay? Questions? All right. Now, number three, setting ground rules with colleagues. It can be, you know, when I have headphones on, don't disturb me. Put a do not disturb sign on your, on your cubicle if you even have a cubicle anymore. Um, and uh, that can be helpful. S also setting ground rules like, um, you know, modeling good behavior. Don't interrupt people if you don't want them to interrupt you. And again, I understand that there's going to be exceptions. There are some people where the nature of their work is they're, they're doing firefighting a lot of the time. And I, I understand that. But you'd be amazed how much less firefighting you do if you implement all the stuff we're talking about 
and you also have a culture where it's a well-oiled machine. If you strive for a well-oiled machine and not for just like this, oh my god, things are just crazy all the time, then you'll reduce your stress a lot and you'll, you'll actually be much more productive. Okay? Uh, final point, uh, redesign the office if you can. Um, I know that's not all possible. I know the trend is for big open office spaces, but the research shows that it's driving people crazy. Drive, I'm sorry? Oh, I, yeah. Susan? We were just, I'm just saying that we got to more of an open, because we were in a cube format. Yeah. Which is really kind of different. <laughs> and in town, so they just flattened everything and made it more bright and everything's open. Yeah, we had some problems. <laughs> so, so, so going from cubicles to open, at least where you, where you work, has been a negative, you'd say? Well, it's a big adjustment to transition to that type of work environment. People are used to having their own cubes in some private space. So yeah. I think the best of the balance is that one is not for everyone. Yeah. And so you've got to have some privacy and options and then have the open floor. Right. Yeah. I think, I think the pendulum is going to sw swing the other direction. I think people are realizing this is a little insane. Uh, people are really unproductive. Very, it's very stressful, by the way. The, the, the content switching that's happening constantly is very taxing on a person's brain. Very, very stressful. So if you can like, reduce that as much as possible, that would be a good thing. Um, and then also work from home if you can. And I know that, that doesn't work for everybody, but I had, I had people on my team, and they had their, they had their you know, get stuff done days, and they work from home. And they were way more productive. And because we had clear goals, and they were motivated, and they know what they were doing, and I could see what they were doing, you know, it was, it was totally fine, because I was able to empower them. But okay. Jim, you know, there's studies about um, being in the office, because the, the pendulum's going the other way. We were at home, and people were working at home, and then there's this idea that you don't collaborate as much, you're not interacting with others, and they want you in the office butts and seats in the office so you can have these water cooler conversations and other things. Yeah, so, so, so just so the, the microphone picks that up. So you're talking about that the pendulum had swung for more people being in the office because people, right, well, I, th I think, I th and I'm, I'm familiar with these conversations, I think that uh, if people's goals are clear and the deliverables are clear and it's quantifiable as much as possible, then as long as people are getting their work done, and the manager knows what they're doing, the people on their team are doing, then, then they, can, they can be very productive at home. And, and people can be in the office but wasting a lot of time as well. So it's really, it's not about FaceTime and it's not about the, the optics, it's, it's really about clear goals and the, and the output. Okay? Good. Very good comments. Let's, let's keep going. This is another thing in terms of uh, time management, which I call blocking out your calendar. So, it's kind of a screenshot of a, my calendar from a while ago. So basically, I take everything that I'm doing, all the meetings, all the projects, all the initiatives, all the to-dos, and I just, I just throw it on my calendar. Right? So stuff in red are things I can't miss, like a talk. Things in blue are, are, are things that I absolutely are committed to doing or, or meetings. And everything in yellow is just kind of things I kind of want to do sooner or later. It's sort of fluid. Maybe I think something's going to take 30 minutes. Sometimes I think it's going to take two hours, and I just put it all in my calendar. Does anybody do this? OK. Does it work pretty well for you? Yeah. yeah. I mean, and what I like about it is a couple of things. Andy Grove, who used to be the CEO of Intel, um, he said, the more you can create routine in your life, the more you reduce your stress. The more routine you can have. It sounds boring. Right? Like we need more entertainment, right? I mean, you know, it sounds boring, but the more routine you can create in your life, the more you reduce your stress. So if you have a weekly staff meeting on Mondays at 1 o'clock, you have lunch every day at noon, you get in the car at 6.30 every night to go home and have dinner with your family, whatever it is that you can have as a consistent thing throughout your, your schedule, there's less surprises, there's less chaos, there's less of a sense of your life being spinning out of control. If you don't manage your time, you cannot manage your life. Rod. Uh, for me, I have a team of about a thousand people, and everyone has a color. So when it comes to their weekly meetings, I can look at the calendar and I know exactly where they are. Time <laughs> off request, all of that is on their particular color. My important meetings are in red. My business meetings that happen weekly are in blue. So yeah, that works really well. That works well for you? Yeah, and it probably reduces your stress because it's not like, a, oh, when are we going to meet this week? Right? Excellent. 
Thank you. Um, now, one of the other things that I do is that, well, part of, the, part of the beauty of this as well is it forces me to think about, well, what can I accomplish today? You know, I, I see, you know, a whole bunch of things on Friday, and I probably won't be able to get to all of them, so I'm just going to prioritize before I start the day. And when I'm doing something, it's like, okay, I've allocated 90 minutes to do this. I'm in the middle of doing it. I'm not going to start thinking about what else do I have to do. I'm just heads down. I made the decision to do this, and I'm just going to do it. That reduces my stress enormously because I'm not constantly thinking, what else should I be working on? I've already made that decision at the start of the day. If, if something comes up, okay, I can change it. Most of the time, that doesn't happen. The other thing I do is that I, I delete it when I'm done with it. Does, there, does anyone else do that, the people who block out your time? I, I, I must be the only I think most people don't do this. I love doing this. So when I'm done with a meeting, like I had to prepare for a workshop, when I'm done with it, I just delete it from my calendar. How do you keep a record of it? It doesn't matter. Her question is, how do I keep a record of it? I'm sorry? How do you keep a record and what if it's a recurring item? So if it's a recurring meeting, so the question is, how do I keep, how, how, how do I keep record of it? Let me think for a second. If it's a recurring meeting, they have a thing which says, OK, do you want to delete just this instance or all of the recurring? So I would delete just this instance. Um, almost never do I need to go back and say, OK, who did I meet three weeks ago on a Tuesday? And there's almost always some kind of invite or some sort of electronic uh, record of it. It's never a problem. And, and, it, and if there's a tiny you know, downside of that, the upside is that every time I delete it from my calendar, I just feel great. It's like, it's done. It's finished. I feel fantastic. And my calendar clears out as the day progresses because I'm knocking things out one at a time. Sir? If you don't finish the task in that time period, do you still delete it? No. No. The question is, if I don't finish the task, do I still delete it? No. I, I will either reprioritize my time to keep going for an extra half hour to get it done, or I'll say, I just ran out of time. I'm going to do this for 30 minutes tomorrow morning. Or maybe you can wait till next week. And then if you schedule another time to do it, do you then delete the previous two time chunks? I, I, usually, I usually slide it, keep on sliding it over if it's something that keeps on going. But, uh, but I'm always reprioritizing. I'm always working on the most important thing. Um, there's stuff that can wait. And there's, there's stuff that's important that can't wait. And then I really block out of time. An another rule of thumb is to do the hardest thing first thing in the morning. Right? It just feels great to be able to take the thing you're dreading, the thing you've been procrastinating on, and OK, I'm going to work on it from 9 until 10.30 tomorrow morning. And when I'm done, I'm just going to feel great. And it builds your confidence. And it, it, it's a great way to uh, develop momentum on the day. Someone had a question here? Owen, Yale, Scott, no? Good. OK. Other questions on this? All right. So the other thing on time management is this prioritization matrix. Being an MBA, I figured I had to have at least one two by two <laughs> matrix in here to justify the tuition. OK. So <laughs> level of effort, low and high, impact low and high. This is very simple. This is very simple. But it, it's, very, it's very powerful, actually. So think about it. High impact, low effort stuff, that's the low hanging fruit. That's the stuff that's going to move the needle. That's the stuff you should be working on all the time. Really knock those out, right? Because it's big impact and not very much effort. The stuff over here, high impact, high effort, that could be like a big software development project. That can be like a new financial you know, IT system, that's a lot of work. A new marketing plan, perhaps. That can be a lot of work, but you're glad you did it. That's, that's the heavy lifting of, of work sometimes. Okay? The, the low impact, low effort stuff doesn't take much time, not very hard, doesn't make much of a difference. And these are the things that you, know, you think, oh, I'll just spend 10 minutes here, a half hour here. Th this is what happens when you get to the end of the day or the end of the week and you realize you haven't done anything. Right? Well, I've been kind of busy, but I don't know what to show for it. That sometimes happens from doing on the low, the, the low impact, low effort stuff. Okay? So you should really try to not do those as much as possible. And then the worst thing of all is the low impact, high effort stuff. Um, 
the worst thing in the, for a manager is when you see your people working hard on something that they shouldn't be doing at all, right? I mean, you just feel like banging your head against the wall. <laughs> now, I remember when I was at Blue Lithium and I had a manager, Dave Zimmon, who's a very talented manager and a guy I respect a lot. And my team was really struggling with all these priorities and things we're working on. And Dave came into the room and said, okay, you know what, let's, let's whiteboard it. Let's write out everything, all the initiatives, all the projects, the ways we're spending our time, what's sucking up our time, and we just put all of it in this two by two matrix. And literally within like 20 minutes, it was crystal clear what we needed to do, what we needed to not do, what we needed to start doing. Right? There's an old framework which is start, stop, continue, which is also a good way of thinking about your initiatives. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Questions? Good. All right. So back to the writing. What I want you to do is this is question three in your in your your workbooks here. Okay. Put all of your activities into this framework right now. Think of think of your goals, the goals you're working on, your initiatives, what's sucking up your time. Maybe it's filling out stupid reports. Right. Put that in here. Put it in the right in the right quadrant and think hard about how you evaluate these. Okay. You got about five minutes. If you have any questions, let me know. Please begin. OK. So now I want you to, I know some of you might still be writing. Always the challenge of <laughs> when to interrupt. Um, I want you to stand up. Stand up. I know it's 820. I know, I know. <laughs> stand up. I want you to pair up with a different person than you paired up with before. And I want you got about four minutes to share what you wrote. OK? Only, only share what you feel comfortable sharing, OK? Introduce yourself to a different person, say hi, and share what you wrote. You are welcome to sit back down <laughs> if you want. You don't have to. OK. All right, so good energy in the room. I like that. All right. How was that? Any surprises from that process of having to write in the quadrants there? I'm curious what quadrants most people found lots of their stuff in. So like maybe show a hands or something like high. High. No, th sorry, this is my this is my oh, workshop, okay. sir. So, okay, how about a great idea? All right, so show show of hands, who who found most of this stuff to be the high impact, low effort? Most of their stuff. In okay. How, all right, how many how many found it in the um, the high impact, high effort? Most of their stuff. Okay, the heavy lifting. Nuts and bolts execution. And the, um, the, this was the uh, low impact, low effort. How about that? Most of your stuff? Yeah, no one wants to admit that. That would be painful. Uh, all right. And then, the, and then the, the low impact, high effort? Yeah, I really hope. Real, most of your stuff? OK. Surprising amount. OK. Yeah, good. So, um, so there you have it. So most it sounds like most people were saying lots of effort, lots of impact. Okay, any, any, who struggled with doing this? Okay, can you can you shed some light on I th on your struggle? And yes, thank you, Hop. And what's your name, ma'am? Uh, Arti. Arti. I struggled with the low impact, uh, low effort column. But I know that I'm definitely doing stuff that I shouldn't be doing. But I just I couldn't think of too many things to put in that uh, quadrant. So. so you're finding a lot of stuff is low impact, low effort that on your. No, I'm finding that I could. I know that all my time isn't being spent on high impact stuff. Right. So I feel like I should be filling out the low impact, low effort because I'm doing things there, which but I just couldn't think of things to write. Meetings. So. Everyone's, got, everyone's got BS meetings. She put that as low impact, high effort. Yeah, that was <laughs> high effort. <laughs> Sitting through well, those meetings. Well, well, well I, re I recently heard a story about a fellow Omaha, Warren Buffett, uh, where he says that you take a list of 30 things that you work on and you identify the top five, and you do the top five, and the other 25 you don't do at all. So it's a do not do list. It's a do not at all, not even a little bit, do not do list. And I think that's brilliant. And honestly, Next Tag, where I worked, we, we did a lot of the absolutely do not do that, not even for five minutes. And that kept us focused on what was really going to matter. But thank you for sharing. This is, this is hard, I think, for a lot of people. 
Uh, okay, other questions, comments, or insights? Ma'am, and what's your name? Okay, Tung Wei. And Ha's running over here with the, or walking. She is sauntering over <laughs> here. There you go. Uh, uh, it's related to this, but I really want to hear your uh, perspective, especially considering your like, experiences. Um, one thing is regarding you know, really setting the goals or setting the rules for yourself. But sometimes there's also beauty of just let things be. And then, or especially in life, you know? Like, well, the beauty of letting things be? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, because there are times we jump in too quickly, we jump in too fast, and then you find that become actually inefficient. It, maybe it makes more sense just let it sit for a little while. But then the beauty is how long do you let it sit, and how long do you set, let it be. And some of the problems are solved by themselves, but some of the problems you actually came back, came back with a better solution. And there are times I jump in right away, and then my reflection is that I, sh I shouldn't jump in that fast. Either maybe because I haven't got enough information, even I had an illusion I did. Or second, they are actually a better person to solve this problem, but just not in my purview. That is a wonderful analysis. Do you want, I, I, I can comment on it. So first of all, I think it's a wonderful analysis. Now, are you talking about business or personal or anything? Oh, anything. Oh, well, I yeah. think sometimes when I lean into this framework and we got into a mode to analyze everything and how do we do it, how do we set up goals, but a lot of time I think those are the things actually really holding me back because I'm so much in that mode and I'm some other things. Right, okay, so I'll... I'll, I'll um, I'll comment on this, and uh, you know, I do a whole separate workshop on happiness and purpose and fulfillment and legacy and life. Perp so, so I'm I'm very in tune to what you're saying, and in, in that workshop, sometimes I share what's called the Serenity Prayer, which is, and you don't have to be religious, you know, but but you know, may I have the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, right? the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And it's very powerful. It's very powerful when there's stuff that no matter how hard you try to start a company or get funded or go public, or reach some sort of goal, or get an additional round, you know, it doesn't always happen. So I'd say, have a goal, work your butt off as long as it's purposeful and meaningful and exciting and inspirational for you. And if it doesn't happen, then you, you, know, you make peace with that, but you, you know that you've tried your best. Um, and then, that, then other times there's like a very simple example of, of an email where, you know, you could reply to it immediately, but if you just like let other people reply to it first, and give it an hour or two hours, sometimes it resolves its, its, its thing. Right? So there's all sorts of examples, but you're getting at some very, some very profound uh, things. So I, I, does that help a little bit? Yeah. I, I mean, we, we're in this obsessed culture of just going faster. And sometimes it is useful to just step back and breathe a little bit and, um, and even think a little bit. I mean, there lots of, there's all sorts of research that you come up with better decisions after you sleep on something. You know, you get an email at 10 o'clock at night, and it's like, you know, I can, I can reply to that tomorrow. And usually the solution you have tomorrow morning is a whole lot better than whatever you would have written at 10 o'clock at night when you're sleepy. But thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Other questions? Ma'am, please. You're Esther? I try. <laughs> How do you help your teammates um, stop doing the low impact? low effort stuff. How do you stop the team? From, what do you think? <laughs> what do you think, Esther? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I mean, other than sort of bringing it to their awareness. Now, um, are you a manager or, a col or are you talking about colleagues? Talking about a colleague. <laughs> oh, it's oh. very close, colleague. The, the, the blonde-haired dude next to you. Maybe. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, well, in in a, in a culture where the expectations are clear, frequent, candid communication, then you can get practice with having those conversations, whether it's with the manager or with the person who reports to you, or also with a colleague. Um, that's one thing. I think. I would assume that you two report to some manager. You don't. Co Your co-founders. Okay. Well, then all the more so, <laughs> right? You need you need to figure out a way to communicate with each other and resolve things, um, and you can have a valid, 
you know, mature, legitimate conversation about what are we working on, what are we not working on, and, and you have to figure it out. I, I don't know what else to say there, right? Ma'am, yes, please chime in. I've actually, I've had to deal with this problem as um, a product manager that's usually hired in after a startup has proven that it's a sellable concept. And so I have to have this conversation sometimes with the leaders that I work with. Um, I feel like some of the factors are like comfort, like I've always done this and it's part of my routine. Sometimes it's there's actually no one hand, to hand it off to and there's valuable insights. So maybe like reducing the frequency of that work is part of it. Um, the other part is also that sometimes it's just fear. They haven't stepped into like leadership or more executive tasks, and so they're trying to avoid it <laughs> because they're used to being the doers. So I think the short answer is sometimes it's just more emotionally driven than like business driven. So just trying to understand like how is that work reaffirming their contribution in their company and how do they want to shift their contribution as part of it. And also they also have to trust the people that they're hiring on. And sometimes it's hard to trust people with your baby. So me helping them trust me and others is part of the experience. I don't know if that impacts you guys at all, but I would say that's been my experience. <laughs> no, that's, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any, yeah, ma'am, please. I would also just add, do you both agree that these activities are low value and low impact? So you may have different beliefs about, about the value of them. Sure. Yeah. Reasonable people can differ. Good. Now I want to. I don't want to get you out here too late, and we got a little bit of a late start. So, but Chris, you had a good comment about or a question about email. Do you want to? I mean, with at the risk of opening a huge can of worms, which I don't want to keep you folks too late, but uh, yes. Go so ahead. Uh, on my matrix, I had a big block that I called handling email, and I thought about it, and they couldn't decide if it was low impact or high impact, or low effort or high effort. So I just sort of put it. Yeah, let's do it, but it takes a lot of time. Thank you. Does anyone have a very succinct uh, way to help Chris with his email struggle? No. <laughs> <laughs> Ma'am. I have some advice. Please. Consistently inbox zero. You think people care more about what you say and the way that you say it than they actually do. I think people appreciate a response faster, even if the wording isn't perfect, even if the spelling isn't perfect. Even if you don't say exactly the right thing, just responding and opening up that dialogue, I think, is more important than getting everything right the first time. And if you have that fear of, like, I have to write this perfectly drafted email, that's what causes procrastination and not getting the email. Excellent. And, you know, what that works with is also, like, company culture and expectations. And it can be very beneficial to say, you don't need to have this perfectly grammatical, eloquent email if it's just an internal thing. We'd much rather go faster and get it done and that, that is part of a, a corporate culture in terms of expectations. Very good. Someone else said something? Yale? And after this, we're going to move on. Yeah, yeah, I just want to add um, a lot of the high effort, low impact thing that is happening when I talk about, when I wrote down emails in my segment was a lot of people are really sensitive and they take things the wrong way if you are being concise and you're not being clear. And that happens, that's, that's really backfired for me. So now I actually have to write four paragraphs and it really sucks. Oh, no, my second no. one is hop on the phone. Yeah. Like if you think something's emotionally sensitive or fragile, get on the phone or see the person in person. Like don't do that over email. Did you look at my slide too? <laughs> <Sounds fun. laughs> Thank you. Amen. Absolutely. As, as we will soon see. <laughs> good. Okay. Let, let's keep going. This is very, very good. Angel, did you? You're right? No? Okay. Good. So. Just as a quick summary here on the part about know-how, we had time management, prevent interruptions, block out your calendar, use your prioritization matrix. Okay, we're going to go quickly into communication. Okay, and we'll probably be done in, I don't know, 10 minutes or so, maybe 15 max. I've got time, but I don't want to keep you folks too late. Okay, so communication, ask open questions. Take a quick peek at this, please. <clears throat> So I worked in sales where I learned that if you ask open questions like this, you're going to be much better at understanding what your customer wants and much better at overcoming their objections and actually making a sale. And in terms of being a product manager, I learned that this was also a very effective way to communicate with people. And any good product manager is actually selling all the time, whether it's the engineers, whether it's the salespeople, whether everyone throughout the organization. So uh, 
and these are questions like, you know, how, how hard would it be? How long would it take? I remember when we were rolling out Yahoo uh, classifieds to Europe in 1999, and time to market was important. And I was, went to the engineers, and I said, okay, we need this launched as fast as we can. And they said, well, it's going to take us six months. And I said, what, what, why, what is it going to take? Why is it six months? And they said, well, we need to build the browse tree for all the different cars and all the different things in classifieds. And I said, well, what, what would it take? to launch it without the browse tree. And they said, well, we have search, which was kind of new for Yahoo in 1999. And I said, well, how long would it take for search to be ready? And they said, oh, like um, two weeks. It's basically ready to go. And you remember, the, the legacy of Yahoo was as this browse tree company. That's how they were founded. That's what made them successful by 1999. And yet I was asking basically a minimum viable product question, which is, do we need that? which is going to take us six months to build, or do we have something else which is actually better and is ready to go? And, uh, and this, this conversation was taking place literally like four months after Google was founded as incorporated as a company. So it reflects the shift of thinking from what was kind of our legacy product to a new way of thinking. And it started with a, a kind of a dumb question for me, which is what would it take? What's the minimum viable product? How are people even using our product? And, um, and what do our customers really want? What do our users want? And because we went with search rather than with browse, we were able to launch within basically a month. Uh, time to mark was very important. It was a very successful launch. By just asking a question like that. So how hard would it be? People say, oh, it's really hard. Really, well, how hard? You know, I mean, if we, if, you know, if we, if we put the, if the CEO approved it, and we put a million dollars budget behind it. We put 20 engineers on it to work on it and we built the marketing team around it. Could we do it then? It's like, yeah, we could do it then. Okay, so it's not impossible, right? So you just get really clear about what the gap is to overcome these objections and think creatively. How long would it take? Oh, really long. Really? How long? Three weeks? Yeah, okay, I can wait three weeks. I'll see you in three weeks, right? Different people have different kind of definitions of what is hard, what is long. Sometimes some things aren't hard, they just take time. Right, and that there's a good. It's good to differentiate between those. Um, how important is it? Right, in sales, this is a very important thing. Someone will say, "Oh, uh, I can't buy your product because I don't like this." I say, "Okay, I, I hear you, but how important is that? You like this, you like this, you like this, you like this. This addresses your needs. I've already talked to you, and you've already explained to me what your what your is important for you. So, how important is this thing over here?" And at that point, they'll usually say, well, you know, it's not that important. It's not a deal breaker. Right? It's just, it's just asking a simple question like that when you frame it with everything else. Um, help me understand. People love to hear that. And what would it take? What would it take? Either it's impossible for human beings to do it, <laughs> or there's some kind of solution with enough money, enough focus, enough effort, enough desire, enough will. And if you start thinking this way, then things aren't just this yes or no kind of struggle of can we do it or not, but well, how could we do it? What would it take to do it? And I think you can find some very nice breakthrough conversations from starting with these questions. Comments? Sir? How might we? Oh, that's a good one. How might we? Uh huh. Very good. Any others? How might we? Yeah. What would it take? Good. Okay. Keep going here. Choose your medium wisely, which is which what this, this woman in the back here. What's your name? Leah. Leah. Thank you, Leah. Yeah, so choose your medium wisely. How many of you have gone into a fight <coughs> by way of texting? Okay, did you win? No, no. It's like nuclear war. It's, there's no winners, right? <laughs> so, so basically choose your medium wisely. And like, like Leah said, the, the more sensitive, the more um, controversial, the more difficult, the more that likely that something is going to blow up, then the more important it is to have as face-to-face -face of a communication as you can as possible. Right? The research shows that a majority of what you take in from someone like me speaking in front of the room is visual. And then a part of it is the tone of my voice, and actually a small fraction is literally the words coming out of my mouth. Yeah, it's shocking, I know. <laughs> it's true. So if it's a sensitive conversation, if someone is not motivated, if they're unhappy with their work, if they're struggling, if they're going to resign, 
if they're really causing problems at the company, then that's not a, that's not a little text thing. That's a face-to-face -face conversation as much as possible. And I'd say never send an email if you're angry. You know, if you're angry, send an email, send it to yourself, and then resend it the next morning, sleep on it, walk around the block, breathe, um, talk, talk to someone so, <laughs> so you can calm down a little bit. All right, any other questions? Okay, Owen, you all right? Go ahead, comment, Owen. Huh? I you have a comment for you, though, on change. Have you heard about the rider and the elephant? So when you're getting anybody to make any change, logic is like this rider on top of the element, elephant. And like you can convince the rider to change what's going on, but that elephant is still going, and your elephants are your emotions. Mm -hmm. So you actually, even if there's logic behind it, you actually have to get whoever has to make that change to get like emotionally invested in like, oh, we're going to be so much more productive if you don't interrupt me. Like, it's just going to be so great. I'm going to get so much coding done if you don't interrupt me. And if you don't get the elephant on board, the rider is just... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good. Okay. So, so moving forward here, I'm going to talk briefly about one-on-one -on -one meetings and then we're almost done. Okay. So, how many of you have weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings with your direct reports? Good. About how long? About how long do these last? An hour? Good. Mostly an hour? But they're what? They're remote. Yeah. Okay. And you think if they weren't remote, you wouldn't do them for an hour or half hour? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think an hour is good. It sounds like a lot of time, but the weekly one-on-one -on -one meeting is your time to get leverage, a lot of leverage with that person. If you want them to be motivated, the weekly one-on-one -on -one meeting helps them be motivated. It shows that you care. You're investing time to be with them. Uh, and in terms of empowering them, it's also important for that. And in terms of, of the know-how and the training so they're successful, the weekly one-on-one -on -one meeting is also important for that. Right? The way I think about it is with, with a weekly one-on-one -on -one meeting is I spend one hour working with someone on my team so that they're effective for the other 39 hours per week or 49 hours per week, or 59 hours, or how, whatever they're doing. It keeps them on track on all of these things that we've been talking about. And if you're like, oh, I'm too busy, can't talk to you, or I'll just do a text, how you doing, I'm fine, I'm cool, yeah, great. You can do that, but if they're leaving your company two weeks from now and they blindside you because they found a better offer, maybe it's because someone's showing them more love. Because show, someone's showing that they care more, that they're more interested, and that they, they feel more appreciated at a different company than you where you don't have enough time even for a half an hour to sit down with someone who's working 70 hours a week, right? So the weekly one is a huge opportunity for you to even differentiate yourself as a manager and even for your company to differentiate themselves in the investing that you're doing in the people. Now, um, why do I have penguins? Because they're adorable, <laughs> okay. And because it's a nice reminder that Weekly one-on-ones while walking is very nice. Steve Jobs was familiar with the research that people think better, the brain works better when you're walking. And so Steve Jobs was famous for doing walking one-on-ones. I know that Mark Zuckerberg does this as well. Jeff Weiner from LinkedIn does this as well. I've done this many times throughout my career and it's very effective. Most of us are working in Silicon Valley. It's a beautiful climate. It's, it's good for our health to get up from our desks and walk around. I think you'll find that people will look forward to the weekly one-on-ones when you can actually get out of the office, walk around a little bit, stretch your legs, and you can still have great conversations about very relevant business things. Okay, questions? Good, all right. Now, what you cover in the one-on-ones are these three questions. Take a peek at that, please. <clears throat> okay, most people don't do this. I've done this and it's worked very, very well for me. Okay, so let me go through this. So in a weekly one-on-one, -on -one, I say, okay, on a scale of one to 10, how is your job satisfaction? You know, one is you're resigning right now. Um, 10 is this the most amazing job you could have in the world. How, what's your satisfaction? And they'll say, oh, Jim, it was, um, I'm a seven this week. I said, really, a seven? Like last week you were a nine, what happened? Well, this sort of frustrated me at work and kind of had a problem with the client here, and then this is something that a colleague did that, that was bothering me. So that's why I'm, my satisfaction is at a seven. So, oh, I had no idea. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. Let me help you out with this, and a colleague can help you out with this, and here's something I need to give you some background on, okay? 
So, you, so without knowing that, without having the weekly one-on-one, -on -one, I wouldn't have known that the morale went from a 9 to a 7 over the course of the last seven days. And remember, the number is just a number, but it's a springboard to a qualitative conversation on how they're feeling. Okay? Now, then I say, okay, my rating of your performance is. Okay? So I say, uh, my rating of your performance is a 6. I say, what? A 6? I, I thought I'm a 10. It's like, well, you dropped the ball on this. The quality of your work was not very good here. And I, I don't think you handle things well with a colleague. So I'm giving you clear, direct, candid feedback right now on something that's happened in the last seven days. We're not waiting for an annual performance review. We're not waiting for some sort of quarterly review. I'm telling you right now is something that happened in the last week. So you can course correct very quickly based on this clear, direct, candid, frequent feedback. Okay? And people appreciate this. And this creates a, a culture of openness and candor and honesty where things are not political because people are used to having these sort of candid conversations. And people actually appreciate this. They may not agree with you, but at least the expectations are clear. And you can give them a chance to improve and learn and grow. And that's what they, people are looking for in a leader. OK, and then number three, how do you rate my performance as your manager? Right? So it's a two-way street. Right? And they say, oh, Jim, I'll, I'll give you a 7. I say, oh, geez, I, you know, what can I do to get to be a 10? What will it take for me to be a, a 10 manager for you? It's like, well, I need better compensation. I'd like you to give me an initiative that I've, I've been wanting to do, that I've been asking you to help me take the lead on. And, um, and here's something else I want you to do. It's like, oh, OK. I tell you what, let me delegate that to you. I didn't know that was so important to you. Let me give that to you and see how you do. OK? And I can't do anything for compensation now, but maybe six months from now. And, and let me see. And there's something I can't help you out with here. Okay, so it's a two-way street, and in doing this, I know that people really appreciate it, they value it, they feel very valued and very motivated as a result of these weekly one-on-one -on -one conversations. Okay, questions, comments? Ma'am. Um, do you find it's necessary to ask these three questions on a weekly basis as opposed to every two weeks or every month? Like, what's the value of asking? Yeah, yeah. So, so the question is, to, it's for the microphone, so, so, so the question is, do I do this every, yes, I ask every week. And I've had people say, yeah, Jim, I'm a 9 this week. I was a 9 last week. Said, yeah, it's like, fine. OK, let's talk about something else. But there's, I've seen people go from 9s to 4. OK, that's a problem. You know? <laughs> What's going on? You know, let's, let's talk about this. Um, so yeah, I ask it every week. And, and, and remember, it's the springboard to the longer conversation, the qualitative conversation of why did it go from a 9 to a 5? Or, what happened that it went from a 6 to a 9? That's good, too. Let me know what's going on. So yes, I ask every week. Good question, though. Other questions? Comments? Ma'am? I, I personally feel uh, asking somebody to rate, like it's very, uh, another way to do it is, you know, what worked, what didn't work this week. I don't know. This seems, I, I'd find it a very hard conversation on a weekly basis with uh, some yeah. of my reports. So you're asking, you're saying it could be a hard conversation on a weekly yes. basis. Yeah, I, I can understand that. Um, and I find that it works very well. It takes a little bit of getting used to. But this what works and what doesn't, doesn't that's not going to tell you if someone went from a 9 to a 6. It's not. It is too qualitative. But what if you have a very uh, emotional... Uh report who is like a four just because you know they're having a bad day I mean so how do you filter that right because you're assuming that the person who you're talking to has really thought about this but many people are you know come unprepared and are like oh it's a two because I had a bad email or something and yeah yeah okay. I'm just curious how how that works so I think I think people get used to it this is part of a company culture or a team process. And I've, I've never had a problem implementing this. Never. Never. I mean, you know, I had someone who said she was happy and then she left after a while. But I knew she was struggling. Um, but, uh, you know, the part of the benefit of this, this is like a doctor taking a pulse when you go into the doctor's office or your blood pressure, is you get, you get a baseline reading and you see how it goes over time. And you see how the trend is developing. And if you have someone on your team who is a 2 and a 2 and a 2 and a 2, I would say, why are you working here? 
if you're miserable, why are you working here? Help me get you higher. And if I can do nothing to improve your satisfaction, then you owe it to yourself to work somewhere else. And I'll find someone who wants to work here. I'm, it's not a threat. It's just for your own sake, you should work somewhere else if your satisfaction's a two. Right? And, and that's, for me, that's just a candid, useful conversation. But you bring up a very good point. Remember, the number is just a springboard to a qualitative conversation. Good question. Any, yes? I'm reflecting on that point of view. And for me, I think um, questions just about like um, gender are starting to come up. Um, I work in product management, so most of the engineers I work with are male, and then most of the business folks in marketing are female. Yeah. And so if I were to, and I manage people across both departments, if I were to ask these questions to maybe some of the women, hmm. I think they would overestimate their, or give me a number higher in their satisfaction and lower in their performance, and then on the engineering side, the inverse. <laughs> so I, I think I'm having, and, and it's not a reflection of what they're actually performing, it's just I, I know that I know how people sort of respond to situations, and I know them really well, so I could probably, you know, adjust that. Um, but I do think, like, if I were to, I think phrasing may be important, I think is the, the point I'm taking away. Um, although I think, like, this is maybe an, an ideal to achieve, but I think there's a little bit of a gendered language issue there that's typically my experience <laughs> sort of pieces. Yeah, no, I think you bring up an excellent point. And remember, just because just they rate themselves as a nine doesn't mean they're a nine. But you are getting a baseline. You're seeing a trend over time. You can disagree with them. And this, this is not the same as a formal annual performance review. It's just over and over again, you're having this conversation of how they think they're doing. And you can, you can set them straight. You can say, oh, you're not a nine. This is a nine. You know, this woman on our team, your colleague, she's a nine. You're not a nine. <laughs> She's doing the level of nine work that I expect, and you're not. And you can be very blunt about that to bring them back a little bit more to reality. You don't have to compare people, but you can just say, this is what I expect, and you're not there. And that is a very useful conversation to have. Because they're not going to go six months thinking they're doing awesome when you disagree. They'll go six days. That's a much better way to go, much better way. OK, very good comments. OK, well, let's wrap it up. So what I want you to do on your, um, your action item is no specific writing, but I want you to start doing this. Try it out. I think you'll be thrilled. And if you're worried about it, then ask yourself, what exactly are you afraid of? Literally, what are you afraid of? Because <laughs> this should be fairly straightforward. <laughs> and I think people, I know people appreciate it. Okay, number three, start using the, me the method with your, uh, the three questions with your direct reports. And uh, I encourage you to go to your managers, if you have managers, go to the board of directors, you know, or the investors, and <laughs> no, ask them. Ask them. I mean, uh, every one of you is sitting in front of a feedback form where I ask you one to ten, how Jim do, right? And uh, I mean, I want to hear. And, and I learn the most from, the, the, from usually the most hostile feedback. Seriously, I may not agree with it, but I was like, oh, geez, okay. That really struck a chord with someone. I had no idea. Thank you for bringing that up to me. Okay? Almost done. So here's everything we did. You've got a whole summary of it on the last sheet of the handout there. Okay? Everything we've gone over. As you see, if it all, all fits together, it works, it works very well, very comprehensively. We didn't cover everything, but I think in the time we've had, we, we covered a lot. All right. So. Um, next steps, make sure you execute on this. You've got a whole lot of action items. Um, I'm going to send you the PowerPoint with, with additional resources that I think you'll find useful. Email me if you've got any questions. Let me see. Uh, I do other workshops, so to the extent that you would like me to come in and do a workshop on leadership, whether it's an executive offsite you have, a conference, a team building, any sort of training, be very honored that you think about me. I do things on happiness, which is more the inspirational stuff, as well as the leadership and the peak performance stuff. And I donate a portion of my speaker's fees to the American Cancer Society. Uh, OK. I like social media, actually. Just don't let me interrupt you with it. But you're welcome to follow me if you want. All right, I'll leave with these final parting thoughts. <clears throat> so we've covered a lot tonight in the time that we've had. But even if you implement 20% of what we've gone over, 
I'm confident that you'll be a more successful manager and your teams will be more successful. And I want to encourage you to think about your life leading your peak performance teams. Imagine your life when your people are motivated because they know that they care about you care about their success. Imagine your life when they're able to do their jobs because you've empowered them. And imagine your life when your teams know how to do their jobs because of the goals, expectations, metrics, and skills, because of the time management, and because of the awesome communication that you have with them in your weekly one-on-ones. When I think about this sort of life for you, I think you'll be really happy. So from the bottom of my heart, I wish each and every one of you lots of continued happiness and success leading your high-performance teams. Thank you.